Hello, welcome everyone, and thank you for attending our session. Um, it's called Shifting Gears with Research Due to COVID. I'm Katie Playcheck. I'm an assistant professor at Ball State University. I'm a biocultural anthropologist, and I conduct research on diet, nutrition, and drug use in India. And like many of you, uh, my research plans were upended this summer due to COVID. And um, I'm currently in the process of getting uh, approvals uh, for the project to hopefully resume next summer. But everyone has had a variety of experiences in shifting their research. And so that's what our panel is about today. My co-organizer is Kelly boyer Antel, and I'll pass the mic to her in just a second. Uh, we have an excellent group of panelists with us. And I just want to thank everyone for taking the time uh, to prepare a talk for today. Uh, we have professors and students who are in various stages of their careers, and we also have a variety of subdisciplines of physical uh, slash biological anthropology that are being represented. Please note that the webinar is being recorded and will be up on the AAPA website if you'd like to view it again. And I will pass the mic to Kelly. Hi, everyone. Um, I also want to thank all of the participants for um, being here and joining us in this webinar and thank all of our panelists for coming and sharing their experiences. Um, so my name's Kelly boyer Antel. I'm also an assistant professor at Ball State University. Uh, Katie and I were tapped to do this uh, particular, to lead this webinar um, since we had, um, we had uh, led a webinar in April when the uh, conference had was canceled. So when the um, initial conference was canceled in April, Katie and I decided to take our discussion and move it online so that we could have um, participants discuss actually how to uh, mentor students uh, in who are doing field work during COVID-19, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, that, that webinar, or that discussion went great. It, it led us to think about certain things that we hadn't been thinking about in the past, um, discussing ethics, you know, sh when can we go back to the field? Wh how can we do our research? Can we, um, how should we be involved with people in the field? Is it ethical to ask field assistants to do more work than they had in the past? Is it ethical to not hire field assistants when they thought they were gonna be hired? You know, there was a lot of questions about, um, kind of what should we be doing? So it's great that we're able to now have this conversation uh, with these panelists and with all of you to see how people are shifting their gears to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. So personally, um, I'm a primatologist and I study West African chimpanzees in Senegal. And I've been looking at gold mining and how the mercury uh, from gold mining has been affecting the chimpanzees in their environment. So it's a time sensitive research topic there's one reason why I really, we're really trying to make sure the data can be collected this year, if possible. Um, now to do that, the big thing that I've been working on is uh, collaboration. Collaborating with my colleague here in the United States who has an established field site in Senegal with a great team of field assistants and staff um, that we're hoping that together we can fund and um, employ her field staff and also collect data at my site. So. I think that's one of the big things that I've learned is that collaborating with your colleagues, both at home and abroad, has been um, kind of a big game changer for me. It always has been, but this is at this moment, it's been extremely important. So I'm actually going to pass the mic back to Katie if she wanted to say something about the changes that she's been doing um, in her research, or we could just head on head to the panelists. Um, you can head on to the panelists. Okay, we'll head over to the panelists. And if anyone does have questions for Katie and I um, and what we've been doing with our work uh, and shifting gears, um, feel free to ask us during the questions, question and answer session. Yeah, and, and so while I get um, Michelle set up as the first panelist, um, let me uh, tell everybody how to ask questions. So um, Michelle, it will prompt you to share your screen. And uh, for everybody who's an attendee, please um, type in any questions that you have into the questions box of your GoToWebinar control panel at any time, and we'll collect all the questions and we'll run through them at the end. But go ahead and type them in as you have them. Okay, Michelle, we can see your screen. You're, you're all good. All right, oh, oops, there. 
All right, so I'm Michelle Rodriguez, and today I'll be talking about some of my uh, shifting gears and kind of changing my perspective as I move towards a more decolonial approach to primatology. So I'm in a state of shifting anyway as I'm transitioning from finishing up a postdoc to starting a tenure track job. Really exciting, not the best timing. So uh, my postdoc work uh, was almost finished, but the last segment of lab work that was supposed to happen March through June didn't get done. Right now we're working on some solutions that hopefully my postdoc institute will be able to fund uh, the additional work that needs to be done. But I'm also moving forward to the projects I planned to start. And I was really excited to get back to primatology. And so that includes some captive work uh, with zoo bonobos at the Milwaukee County Zoo. Hopefully I can get this started, though getting undergrads uh, in and collecting data is probably gonna have to wait a little bit. But the other thing I was really excited to get back to was field research in Costa Rica. And so uh, with collaborators, we had these uh, projects planned looking at anthropogenic influences in spider monkeys. Uh, my colleague Stacy, or sorry, Tracy had already uh, worked on applying for some grants for the first component, which was some ethnographic work. It's probably best we didn't get funded to start this research this summer, but uh, right now we're planning on resubmitting our grants, but holding off on immediately submitting. The other thing was I was planning on uh, submitting some new grants to look at stress and spider monkeys across anthropogenic pressures. But now, whether I or Tracy can get to the field is a bit of a mystery. We do have a Costa Rican colleague, which is good, but a lot of things are up in the air for when travel for field work will be safe and ethical. And this has given me a reason to really think about, now is a good time to pause and think about the ways in which we do primate research and the ways in which it needs to change. So I've been focusing a lot on doing a lot of reading and thinking about decolonizing primatology. And so I recently developed this reading list. It's a work in progress, uh, but it's reflecting a lot of what I'm reading and thinking about. Uh, with colleagues, we're also working on this citation uh, resource. Basically, it's a big Google Sheet that we're all editing right now so that we have uh, peer-reviewed citations uh, from African, Asian and Central and South American primatologists. And uh, with a couple of my colleagues, we're working on this edited volume. And it was a plan we had uh, for a while before this all hit, but it's been a really good opportunity to think about whose voices we are including. How can we make sure that we're having these equal partnerships with uh, primatologists across the world in different countries? And I think the big thing that we need to focus and that I'm thinking about as I go forward in writing uh, future grant proposals is really rethinking field project design. If I look back at some of uh, my previous research, it really was kind of parachute primatology. And we need to move away from that. And so uh, I think the most important thing here is making sure that we're forming equitable partnerships with habitat country primatologists, but we really need to rethink the ways in which we're doing this to make sure that primatology can be more equitable and more sustainable. And that's about it. So I can take questions after. Great, so next we'll have Delanda. And so Delanda, so let me make you presenter. Okay, it should prompt you. Um, greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Delon Justinville. I'm a PhD student at American University. Um, and before I continue, I just want to quickly thank Kelly and Katie for extending the invitation to join the panel today and for the uh, AAPA for hosting it. Um, so in my research as a bioarchaeologist, I tried to, I've come to start defining my approach as a 
um, a black feminist biocultural approach to the study of the human skeleton and the human body more broadly. Um, and the the region that I that I uh, that I research is the Mid Atlantic, and my dissertation project is more specifically on um, here in D.C., which I'm very fortunate for. And I tried to highlight the specific uh, block that I'm working on on the map, so hopefully you all can see that. Um, so on this block, what has happened is that over the past two decades, every construction project that has that has had to delve beneath uh, beneath uh, street level have turned up uh, remains that have displayed likelihoods of African ancestry. So um, at this point, I think there are about maybe an MNI of 10, but this past February, to no surprise, um, one of the larger renovation projects have turned up uh, have uh, turned up about 20, a minimum number of 20 individuals, um, all of which we are displaying like we have African ancestry. And you know, so the, some of the papers in Georgetown covered uh, this, this find, um, and from some of the more broad qualitative research that we've been doing on these remains, we are starting to see, we're starting to theorize that there's a strong likelihood that these remains uh, might have an affiliation with the 1832 cholera pandemic, um, the cholera pandemic that passed through DC. Uh, but what had happened was as we were as we were taking out these excavations, you know, doing things within proper protocol, the uh, COVID pandemic um, upended us in such a way that we had to, you know, do some makeshift, um, do, do, do some makeshift changes, and we eventually had to cut the project off as best as we could without removing the entirety of the remains from from harm's way of the construction project, um, which uh, which presented with me, which presented a kind of an ethical issue. You know, we're supposed to be tending to these remains with a sort of a care and quality of our research that doesn't, you know, re-inscribe them to the violence that they already experienced. So, thinking through this, uh, thinking through how I can best tend to these remains without having access to them, and also trying to convince myself that I'm still committed to a bioarchaeological project without explicitly doing this bioarchaeology, um, really shifted my thinking in terms of having to take a step back. And I tried to reflect on um, what those who came before me have done. You know, I'm not the first uh, bioarchaeologist to have dealt with a, rem uh, a plethora of issues and how we appropriately tend to these remains. And so in thinking through, you know, thinking who came before me and thinking of the breadth of research that I can pull from and thinking of my own intellectual genealogy, um, I'm very fortunate to um, have come upon, which is no surprise, my own advisor's uh, uh, work and research. And he really like, pushed me to start thinking of positionality, reflexivity, and commitment across this discipline. And instead of focusing more on um, how, how, how bioanthropological this project is, instead trying to reflect on what it is I'm trying to do and how I'm trying to be in service to the, the community and the, the, community descendants of these, the community descendants of these remains, um, and think about how I can bring my expertise as a bioanthropologist to better um, serving that commitment. Um, instead of focusing on, you know, what it is that these remains can reveal about this historical system, I began to instead think about the parallels between how these remains might have been relegated to this, uh, the, to this outskirts of social space and how that might have a lot of similarities to the current pandemic in which we're seeing um, black and brown communities affected at a greatly disproportionate rate, how we're seeing these mass burials happening um, in cities, on the outskirts of cities. And you know, some, some of the concerns are that how are these burials being marked so that they aren't just paved over in a few years. So that is the, the major shift that I'm thinking of, you know, how is it that I can tend to these remains with my skills as a bioarchaeologist without necessarily being in the room and um, doing that bioanthropological research at the current time since I can't. And in that thinking, how can they better, how can I bring about a more broad and inclusive approach to make sure that I am, you know, tending to them and their histories and then the violences that they suffered in the best and most, uh, committed way possible. And so what, what really inspired me was this uh, position statement and disclaimer that my advisor, Dr. Richard Watkins, had in one of her pieces. But also uh, I included two other of her works that really helped me thinking of, you know, what it means to study uh, altered um, uh, remains that have been put into altered statuses and also how we can reposition the context of our research. Afterwards, so that's it for now. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, Charles, you're next. I'm going to make you presenter. Um, okay, it should prompt yeah. you for sharing your screen. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let me get my screen up. Yep. 
you see it? Okay, I see that. Okay, so uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, basically the organizers of this uh, webinar, as well as this, uh, the AAPA for basically organizing these uh, webinars. Um, my name is Charles Musiba. I'm an associate professor at the University of uh, Colorado, Denver. Uh, I'm a paleoanthropologist. I work in, a, in East Africa uh, and also in South Africa, but today my talk, I will be talking a little bit about a project which we started a couple of years ago. And which actually just hit the snag this year with uh, COVID-19. Uh, we were supposed to be in a field uh, doing some uh, mapping using 3D imaging and ground penetrating radar at Laetoli, basically mapping some one of the ancient uh, hominin footprints, uh, which are dead about 3.6 million years old. Uh, the site I work at, uh, it's at Laetoli, northern Tanzania, uh, which is actually um, one of those uh, sites, very famous um, uh, and probably part of the, uh, what I would call the cradle of humankind, um, sort of part of Africa. Uh, the site was actually discovered in 1976 uh, and well documented in 1978 by uh, Mary Leakey. Uh, the footprints were discovered by Andrew Hill, uh, who was actually a graduate student and um, is now deceased, but uh, was a professor at Yale. Um, but as you can see in this image, uh, I think a lot, almost everyone in them knows the light oil footprints. Uh, what's so important about these footprints is that it's not that, that actually they give us uh, some information about uh, position behavior uh, of our ancestors, but the biggest challenge with this footprint, it's the fact that um, once they're excavated, um, they tend to disappear. And this is what's happening, uh, particularly in, in, in um, Adelaide in, in Tanzania. So what we've been trying to do in the past um, three years is try to come up with ways first, first to uh, proper document all the prints and, and make sure that maybe uh, there are other prints somewhere and of course, uh, as part of that, in, 19, in the 2016, uh, additional footprints uh, were actually sort of discovered uh, at Laetoli. And as you can see here, uh, we, got, uh, we got two tra um, uh, tracks of, uh, of the prints. The one on the left, on, um, it's actually this uh, site G prints, uh, the original prints which were actually discovered by Mary Ricky. And the, the other one on the right, um, that's actually an image of the 2016 prints which were discovered by one of my colleagues, Masao, and his co-workers. So these, these, uh, these prints are very, very important because they help to answer a lot of questions about the, our, ori basically our evolution and why did we become bipedal. Um, but some of the questions which we've been much more interested about was actually uh, trying to figure out who actually who are the uh, printmakers at Laetoli? And, and, and to answer that question, we actually have to do a lot of other research. Um, so we're doing a lot of excavations, usually in the summer. And unfortunately this year, we're not gonna be able to do that. So, so shifting from um, shifting gears, uh, from basically being in a field in the summer and collecting data and not being in a field in the summer, we decided that there are a couple of things we can do. Uh, so one thing which I think we all need to know is that uh, paleoanthropologists, uh, usually in the past, uh, we have been much more reluctant in sharing data, but now actually sort of we are learning with, uh, the fact that we actually have to share data. And people have been sitting on a lot of different data for many, many years. So I've reached out to a lot of um, uh, a lot of my colleagues, and we have an organization which is an uh, Rift Valley um, Research Consortia, um, uh, and that uh, we have agreed that we're actually going to share some data. So there is a lot of data, and uh, lucky enough, some of that it's in a 3D image um, sort of um, format, and which can actually be used to answer some of the other questions which we need. But the other thing which is very important, um, and we haven't been able to do, is the fact that 
uh, there was the concept, there's a conservation um, sort of uh, element on this uh, project. And that means we were supposed to actually do uh, 3D imaging mapping and then come up with some guidelines on how to actually uh, sort of preserve those footprints. The idea is to make those footprints uh, accessible to others. And, and now I think uh, we know that probably digitally, that's the, the only way we're gonna be able to do. And um, which uh, to some extent has made me realize that um, from now on, uh, we need to actually sort of collect the data in a way that it has to be standardized uh, and actually sort of um, and portable that the data can actually, you can give it to other people and people don't have to spend um, 300 hours trying basically to clean it up before they can actually use it. So uh, we have to come up with best practices uh, on how to actually sort of collect that data in the future. But also uh, the data we have, this is the time for anybody who has got data to clean it up and actually sort of make it accessible to others. And that's all for the, uh, I would stop here. And if there are questions, I would be able to answer them later. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Ari. I'm going to make you presenter now. Uh, it should prompt you now. Thank you. So thank you. Yes. Thank you to the organizers for setting this up. And um, for giving us the chance to talk about how COVID-19 has affected our research and also thanking all the technical people for helping us with the, you know, the PowerPoint. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Ari uh, and I live and work currently in Suriname. I have a master's in biological anthropology uh, from Kent State University. And so um, my focus is primarily uh, spider monkeys so I'm also a spider monkey uh, fanatic. Uh, and I look specifically at how gold mining, small scale gold mining specifically, impacts the behavioral and the feeding ecology of uh, wild monkeys. And so in Suriname, we have serious issues with the use of mercury in small scale gold mining. And so uh, I did a lot of um, biological monitoring of uh, mercury in urine and feces of monkeys. And so currently I am a doctoral candidate at the University of Suriname with Tulane University. And, and so I should have shifted from wild monkeys to human health. And so at some point I will find the uh, common ground of uh, looking at human health and uh, monk primate health. And so for those of you who do not know where Suriname is, hopefully you all do, um, we are in the northeastern part of South America between French Guiana and Guyana with Brazil in the south. And so I have a screenshot here from the COVID-19 dashboard. Um, it's engineered by John Hopkins University. And so uh, as of today, we have 594 cases, uh, 14 deaths from COVID-19 in Suriname, and maybe pale comparison to other countries like Brazil or even the United States. But you can imagine uh, Suriname has a population of half a million, so 594 cases and 14 deaths is kind of a lot for, for us. And so as you can see, um, we were kind of okay for a while with uh, confirmed cases, but from mid-May till now, um, we've had a sudden increase of COVID-19 cases. And so how has that impacted us in Suriname? Well, for me specifically, like I said, I am a doctoral student. And so I did um, have plans for doing some field research but I also am involved with a primates and fragments uh, guideline with IUCN. And so initially, I think uh, most of you know that there was a conference supposed to be held in Ecuador later this year, the IPS. 
and the Latin American Primatology Society meeting. Um, but along with all other conferences, as you know, um, we will no longer be holding those conferences. So um, that has been impacted and my own field research. So I, I am doing a lot of environmental sampling of mercury in freshwater fish and in sediment. And obviously the big uh, focus currently is human hair sampling, which is greatly impacted because obviously COVID-19 affects humans uh, primarily. And so that has a lot of ethical implications because we have indigenous and tribal communities in Suriname. And now we have confirmed cases in those villages. And so I am no longer able to go into the field and collect hair samples. Just for many reasons, um, we were on lockdown, so there were no transportation methods to get to those villages. And obviously, if a community is in lockdown, I as an outsider um, would be unethical for me to enter such a community and possibly uh, introduce COVID-19 uh, into that community. Um, but back to the specific, specific project. So for the IUCN work, um, most of it is now online. We meet regularly online. It's just a matter of checking each other's time zones because we're all over the world. Um, so it has worked out. So thank, thank God for Zoom, Skype, and all those other platforms. Uh, so that, you know, even though the Congress itself was affected, but our meetings itself, we sort of uh, adapted to each other. Like I mentioned, the field work, uh, all of that field work is suspended for now. Um, depending on how the cases go in the communities and how, how much air travel um, is allowed to the interior, I might be able to resume that this year. And a lot of my sampling, environmental sampling, was also seasonal related. And so in the rainy season, which is now, I was supposed to collect environmental samples. And so due to COVID-19 and all the measures around that, I will most likely have to wait till next year to do all my environmental sampling. And so what COVID-19, and I think the others have mentioned it as well, what we kind of learned from that is collaboration is key. It's not just you in the field, it's you know the field assistants, all your other colleagues. And so, you know, with I wouldn't say the extra time, but time at home or time in extra time in the office, collaboration has increased. Uh, we exchange ideas, we meet new colleagues, create new networks, uh, which is really nice. And so I like to look at it in the context of climate change, which is I always say is the other pandemic we are facing because it's now it's a COVID-19 pandemic, but climate change has been affecting us globally for a long time now. And so we should see it in the context of that. Um, it's adaptation and resilience. I know each situation is different. Um, every country has a different situation. Field work is different. And it's kind of like the stages of depression. You go through the stages of acceptance. Uh, and that's one thing, mental health. I mean, a, a lot of us, Maybe we kind of forget about mental health, our own mental health, mental health of our colleagues, but that is key in our work. Because if you're not a happy researcher, you know your, your data is probably affected by that. Your project is affected by that. So um, at some point you, like I say there in the slide, you accept what you have or what has happened and you commit to change, to adapt to it. And so I would like to part by saying, please stay connected. Um, I think this PowerPoint will be shared with all the others. Um, stay fit and stay passionate about your work. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, James, I'm gonna prompt you to share your screen. Sounds good. Okay, it should ask you now. Can we see it? Yep. Yeah, excellent. So, hi, uh, I'm James Gibb and I'm presenting with Lucy Drew McCarricker. Um, we're going to be talking about equity in research, representation, and the development of narratives around COVID-19. Uh, so for me, my plan, COVID has uh, caused some shifts to my research, but others have been unshifted. So my plan, my original plans for the summer were to conduct, uh, continue with ongoing analysis and write up of secondary data, uh, primarily focused on understanding non-communicable disease risk among LGBTQ 
to SIA plus peoples. Uh, and I'll use queer as a kind of catch all for that group, just because it's a little cumbersome to mention, say, say the entire acronym. I uh, hope nobody takes offense. Um, Lucy Drew? Um, so um, I'm just going to briefly introduce myself. Um, I'm Lucy Drew McCarricker. I'm a, currently a postdoctoral fellow at McMaster University. Um, and I am a primarily a biocultural anthropologist. And I am transitioning from my postdoc into a, a limited term assistant professorship in uh, winter of 2021. And for my postdoc, uh, for the last almost four years, I've been running a project called Mothers to Babies in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, and it's a community health and knowledge translation project aimed at supporting uh, pregnant people to eat well and live healthfully during pregnancy. And because we've been, um, my collaborators and I have been collecting data for more than three years now, we have reams and reams of it, and so my main plan for summer 2020, like James, was to um, to analyze and write up data that had already been collected. So um, it, for the most part, that wasn't really impacted by um, the pandemic. James? Uh, and so my other plan was to complete my MSc, which uh, I'm a, I'm a, I was a master's student at the University of Toronto. My book, I'm also a biocultural anthropologist, predominantly focused on my book and development of sexual minorities. Uh, and so that was just more accelerated. It wasn't so much uh, impacted, but I did expect to finish it by the end of the summer, not so much by the end of the spring. Um, Lou? And, and um, yeah, so James and I are both in this sort of place of transition. So James was just finishing up his MSc and I'm uh, finishing finishing up this uh, long postdoc. Um, and so my other sort of major plan, fast plan was to uh, wrap up a lot of odds and ends around relationships with um, community stakeholders and um, just and all the practicalities that go with ending a, a long-term relocation and project. Um, Sorry, go ahead. Oh, James, go ahead. Okay. Oh. And my other plan was to initiate a new project investigating food security uh, among Toronto's uh, communities. Um, and that obviously didn't happen so I had, uh, because of the pandemic and there are more pressing socioeconomic and health issues that were obviously going to take precedent over that project. So I, we, yeah, as Lucy just mentioned, we were both kind of posed, posed for like a shifting gears in terms of research. Um, and so that resulted, and so part of the fellowship that would have funded the food and security project, uh, I, I had to attend like kind of like bi-weekly meetings. And in one of those meetings, I heard about uh, a university-wide grant to called the Toronto COVID Action Initiative uh, to kind of, fund Toronto's response to the, to the COVID pandemic. Uh, and one of the things that kind of, uh, I've thought about it a lot, one of the things I hadn't been really hearing about was um, the queer community being represented adequately in the narrative around COVID. Uh, and also kind of the, the, how, who was also articulating that narrative and their experiences and vulnerabilities and resiliences during the actual crisis that's been happening. And so that kind of motivated me to uh, reach out to some mentors and collaborators, the super being one, uh, to apply to this grant. And, we uh, ended up applying. I, I found out about it the Friday. I think I messaged Lucidra that evening <laughs> on Facebook, and we ended up having the grant was due the one following Wednesday, and so we kind of had to get our kind of uh, kind of buckle down and get on this. So, but uh, and that kind of allowed us to. Um, we were fortunate to get it and kind of get a good team of represent represented in that project. Uh, but yeah, it was kind of a very. Uh, erratic change. I just want to acknowledge James for doing an amazing job of pulling together what ended up being a team of, I think, 10 researchers at, at different career stages in, and blindly emailing, reaching out to people just completely out of nowhere and pulling this amazing group of predominantly queer researchers from all over the University of Toronto, different departments, different ages and stages, and uh, managed to get this grant in in successfully. Um, so just huge, that was a like massive, that was a perfect example of shifting gears and it also resulted in me putting some um, some of my ideas on the back burner and, and shifting towards this. So well done James for, for pulling that together on an incredibly short timeline. Um, and so I guess one of the things we're hoping to come out of this project is ensure that the queer community, voices from the queer community, queer communities are included in the narrative kind of articulating the pandemic. Um, and also, we were very fortunate to receive uh, a very generous funding to support not only being able to pay our participants, our incentivized participating in the project, 
uh, and, but also to support uh, research assistants at undergraduate and graduate level who may have uh, been inver adversely affected by uh, COVID-19. And predominantly, we want to support queer, queer identified students um, who may not always have the kind of pre-existing networks of support that other students have. Um, and then obviously I'll identify some of the ways that COVID-19 is impacting the queer, queer communities and how uh, these communities are responding. Um, and yeah. in, in keeping with that, um, James has also, um, James and I have uh, initiated a, a small, we already put together a small piece uh, about sort of the differential or um, impacts of, of, uh, uh, of COVID-19 on, on queer identified uh, populations and communities and then um, so that was just a small local piece and then James took the lead on initiating a much larger piece for the American Journal of Human Biology and we've already um, that's we've just gotten reviews back for that um, so again noting with a, a lot of attention to uh, intersecting identities and how and differential impacts of, of the pandemic on, 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 on LGBTQ 2IS AS um, communities so we've already got already got that going, and we have lots more um, things in the pipeline. And so uh, we would just like to a, acknowledge the, the queer communities for participating in the study. Uh, I'm also very grateful for Lucidia's support, who's been, she's been a fabulous mentor throughout my graduate career. Uh, and we're obviously grateful for our financial support from the University of Toronto, uh, University of Toronto School of Cities, uh, and our collaborators, uh, our acting PI Jessica Fields, our collaborators Zachary Dubois. Uh, Robert Paul Jester, uh, Ali Gray, Sarah Williams, Macro Mayachi, Lori Ross, Marion Lowe, and Ma Ma Maddie Sim oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much for having us, Katie and Kelly. We really appreciate being able to showcase some of the, the work that we're doing. And I echo all those, those thanks. And uh, again, just want to acknowledge what an amazing job James has done as a, a really junior scholar, um, just making the most of a really, really challenging situation. Um, and bringing together voices in a in a in, a, in, a tr in an inspiring and I think um, in an inspiring way that I think is going to create a really fairly amazing project over the next year. And, um, I think that's about it. Thanks again to the organizers. Great. I'm I'm going to as Katie and um, Kelly come back on. I'm just going to remind everybody if you have questions, you can type them into your questions box on your GoToWebinar control panel. And Katie, do you want me to put up the closing slide now uh, as we do questions? Okay. Okay. Um, we do have some questions. Should we start with those, or did you and Kelly have something that you wanted to say first? Um, we can go ahead and start with the questions. Okay. Uh, the first one is from Jennifer Kramer, and it, it says, for Michelle, some funding sources, particularly internal institutional ones, support the primatologists to do their work overseas, but do not cover expenses of training or employing overseas folks. How can we better get that recognized as a key part of the work and cost getting funder support to help us stop the parachute approach? Right. So uh, I agree. This is one of the biggest problems. And I think as we go forward, I think it might be helpful if primatological organizations start pulling together some position statements that we can put to universities and to funding agencies to really frame the way in which only funding North American researchers ends up creating this really exploitative and inequitable uh, situation. And if we can kind of get a wild field change for all of us working together to, you know, state to funders that we can't do this research without adequately hiring and paying field assistants, um, then I don't think we're ever gonna really solve this situation. And I know, I mean, a lot of us have had these conversations where we're like, oh, well, we want to do this, but we're told we can't, and we're kind of scrambling to figure out how to best manage our funds to do that. But I think as a discipline, we really need to come together and acknowledge that this is a problem and kind of demonstrate the problem to the universities and the granting agencies that may not recognize it. 
great. Um, the next one is from uh, Leslie and it says, thanks, great panel. I'm curious what the panelists experiences have been with granting agencies and their willingness to be flexible with grant extensions, et cetera. <laughs> All right, I can go first. Uh, so my postdoc, the last portion of uh, lab research was funded by Wonder Gren and they've been very flexible with basically just kind of giving an extension um, that we can kind of set our dates with in order to get the research done. Yeah, same here with NIH. Um, they've been very accommodating and obviously it's the, their funders for human health. So uh, if they weren't accommodating, I would be surprised. But um, yeah, I have, from other colleagues as well, I've heard that um, various funding agencies are just um, very considerate of what's happening and just give extensions. I can also add, I'm, um, I'm in the process of applying for extensions from uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, I imagine they will be accommodating, but I, um, it's, a, it's a, a longer process than I expected. <laughs> um, but I also think just came to my mind for any of those, for any of the AAPA uh, organizers out there listening, that maybe um, another panel uh, with funding agency, representatives from funding agencies might be really helpful to find out what are funding, how are funding agencies responding to COVID-19 and how are they going to be able to help us make sure that we can shift our research and move forward and still have funding. Just an idea. Yeah, and also I think that uh, the other thing which we have to think about, I have funding from uh, outside sources, but these are actually funding from the European community. So they were actually much more uh, accommodating than uh, most of the US funding agencies because they, 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 they know that uh, you cannot actually be working in other communities when you have a situation like this. And so they were actually able to postpone um, sort of um, releasing the funds until we are sure that we can actually get back to the field, which is great. But the one thing which uh, I don't know for some of you guys, but uh, we, we already, we've been talking about this. It's our local uh, collaborators in those countries. For instance, in my case, uh, there are people I work with, I've been working with for the last 15 years. And, and being in a field with them, this is also part of their resources, basically source of income. They have kids who go to school and, and we've been thinking and talking um, with some of my colleagues in, my, in the field of paleoanthropology to try to figure out a way in which we can start for people working in various countries and particular sites. For instance, people working in Tanzania in this case, we are thinking about establishing a trusted fund in which actually we can help with the local, uh, local people um, in those in a, in a sort of in the host in the host countries, and I think this is something we have to start to think about it. And also, this becomes part of decolonizing our fieldwork um, in a way that actually we are not the only ones who actually benefit from that. And the other thing, which I think too, is just we need to do more in terms of um, including those. Uh, uh, host people into our publications. We usually acknowledge them as field assistants and all that. I don't think they are field assistants. We can see now when, when actually you, you, you are not able to collect your data and you're actually uh, relying on them, they should be, they should actually be co-authors to some extent. So we have started in a, at my research project, we do, we have done that. And I think we need to continue to do that. And that actually sort of will help with our institutions. Uh, when you can go and say, look, I have my, 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 uh, my collaborators uh, and they're waiting to do this. We need to release some funds so that they can actually get some work done. And this is the only way we can collect more data, particularly now. I think people really understand. Thank you. Okay. Uh, great. So uh, the next one is from Craig Byron, and this one's a little bit more fun, I think. It says, this is a question for any of the primatologists. 
There was a story by the French news network France 24 about a population of macaques that suddenly have no source of tourists feeding them anymore and have taken refuge in an abandoned movie theater. Have you heard of this story and can you offer any details? I believe it was reported out of Laburi, Thailand, and I can guarantee that my undergraduate students are going to want some details. Anyone? Okay, so personally, I haven't heard of this story, and I'm hoping someone will send me the link soon. Uh, have you heard anything, <laughs> Ari? Okay, nope. so this is going to be my commentary yeah. on having not read it. That uh, one of the problems that we're seeing now with a lot of provisioned monkeys with uh, changes in human behavior is we're seeing changes in monkey behavior. So I think there's another viral video of kind of monkeys taking over towns and getting aggressive because they're not getting the food that they used to. And uh, this is obviously a big problem, but we really need to look at the ways in which uh, human populations are interacting with the monkeys and what the downstream consequences can be. And personally, I think that's why any provisioning needs to be really carefully done and carefully planned, but there's also, of course, a lot of cultural precedents that uh, have preceded the tourist industry and are now just kind of being amplified by tourism. But the ways in which human primate interactions are being shaped by tourist pressures is a really complex problem we need to deal with. I'll also add. I was going to say, I'll add, I have not, I also haven't heard of it, but I'm, I was trying to quickly Google it on my phone because it sounds very interesting. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but one thing I did think of as uh, Michelle was talking to is that something um, that you may be interested in looking up online is um, the, a new term called the anthropause uh, and how yeah. um, wildlife biologists, ecologists, primatologists are trying to get out and study this, this impact on um, animals in general, but um, definitely be something that primatologists could also look at as well is how are how is wildlife reacting and changing based on this shift in human behavior so anthropause is what that was called excellent um our next one is from uh, carly batiste it says fyi that leaky now requires a supplementary document for their student research grant applications that basically has to describe a sort of contingency plan for COVID-19 interruptions, travel, data collection, et cetera. So that goes back to the first question about, uh, about funding sources, et cetera. Um, the next one's from Amanda Thiel. It says, any suggestions for connecting with and or supporting the communities we conduct research with that we can't visit this year? Considering obstacles like limited technology access, what responsibility do we have as researchers in a position of privilege and it says this might be a question for Katie or others working with people on the ground in international situations. So I guess I'll take that one since um, my name was mentioned. Uh, one thing uh, I keep in touch with the with my field assistants and the people that I work with in India through WhatsApp, and we've just always done that. And um, we have like little groups and stuff that we stay connected with and. Uh, for my research currently, uh, since India went into shutdown a couple months ago, we like all work was stopped. So I was unable to get IRB approvals and stuff anyway at that time. So we're restarting that process now. So that's how I'm staying connected. I don't know if anyone wants to add to that, but um, so nothing has really changed. And in terms of the way that we communicate anyway, but yeah, we do stay in contact and we send each other funny memes and you know, just continue to build rapport and keep things light and, you know, also ask how things are going on and how they feel about, you know, like if they're, if their organizations or the people on the ground are even ready to receive researchers, um, if the cases are lower. So I think just having an open dialogue and keeping things, um, yeah, open and having those discussions are really important just throughout the process. Um, I, I can add to that a little bit. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I take a very similar approach here in the, the local Hamilton project I've, I've been working on, and um, 
partner really, really closely with our local public health department. And I mean, those communications are predominantly digital, not through WhatsApp, but we, we just talk on the phone fairly regularly um, with our with our local partners. The institutional partners the, who have some privilege and power that's not that's not been challenging. But since the pandemic, some of our the most vulnerable pregnant people, I've, uh, including so among among those who are fairly vulnerable in terms of their socioeconomic position. Um, but who are also relatively resilient because they self-selected to be part of our study and were fairly active. Um, they have been really hard to get a hold of. So I've, I've, my, myself and our collaborators, we have been reaching out by phone and text and for the most part really haven't gotten a lot of response and I don't really know what else to do beyond just calling them directly, which hasn't really um, we just haven't, I think people are just kind of overwhelmed. They don't have the bandwidth ne necessarily to really be super invested in this predominantly research-based relationship with the exception of a couple of sort of friends who I've made through the project. So yeah, I don't know if anybody else, else has thoughts on how to go farther for for those people who are, who are really, really having, who are really, really overwhelmed. I would, I would, I would welcome any, any thoughts. Um. Well, I have a couple ideas just regarding, like, we get, uh, just in terms of my own experience with this project related to COVID. Uh, so, if like you are doing COVID research right now or, or applying to any funding for COVID, I think it's really important to write in your grant budgets, like, funding to a, uh, like, kind of compensate people, participants for their time because of the socioeconomic vulnerabilities that are existing right now. And I think we, that we've seen a lot of money thrown at COVID, but not necessarily a lot of money thrown at like socioeconomic interventions that would support these very vulnerable communities. Because I think a lot of us from biocultural anthropology are very cognizant of the fact that most, a lot of the times, health, health, uh, adverse health outcomes tend to follow the fault lines of socioeconomic marginalization. Uh, I also think it's also kind of a key opportunity to write like uh, funding into your budget, bu budgets, writing budgets that could also support uh, community partners who could also quite benefit from that, uh, fund, like that stream of income. So that's just one thought on my end. That's, that's a really good thought, at least for going forward for future grant strategizing. Uh, for for paleoanthropology, it's a little bit tricky because usually you're in a field and, and but uh, lucky enough, uh, communication, especially the p part of the world where I work, it's been much easier. We, we got people with WhatsApp and the group I work with, I was actually able to basically send them some money to support them uh, out of my pocket. And there are actually a lot of um, apps out there which you can use. Uh, for instance, if you work in East Africa and Kenya, Tanzania, you could use SendWave, which actually you could get some money to direct to their cell phones and they can actually get this electronic money and they can actually go and transfer it and have some cash. I had uh, four of my colleagues who actually I work with, uh, their kids were supposed to go back to school. And they were hoping that this summer they could actually have used that income from, from our field work. So what I have done basically, it's advanced them some money and say next year, when, if we end up going back in a the field, then we can figure out some ways in which you can actually work together, work out something. So we have to be flexible enough to do that. And I think, that's the only way. And of course, writing in into uh, future grant proposals, putting in some line items for that kind of activities would really be most would really be important. So a couple of quick updates. So uh, in the chat function, we had Craig Byron share with us the, the link on the macaques. I pasted that into the chat function so everybody can look at that. Um, and then we had a few sort of follow-ups to this question. Um, Jennifer Kramer said, to Katie's point, I've received questions about the protest, protests and George Floyd's death from my field team. It's really important to keep those relationships and be there for each other when we can't get together on site. Um, and then um, uh, keeping with this topic, uh, Sally Serafin said, in light of the panel's emphasis on sharing and collaboration, as well as decolonizing anthropology, it's important to note the struggles uh, of BPOC and, and bioanthropology, where people tend to be very proprietary and nepotistic with their research sites. 
I'm not sure that's a question, but I don't know if anybody has any uh, comments on that one. Okay. Yeah, um, I mean, you, I mean, I think that was it. Was a was a comment, and which I think it's valid because we have been. I mean, um, I think COVID nineteen has also shown us that we need to collaborate even more. Uh, and and I know in paleoanthropology this has been really big big issue sometimes to get data from other people, but now everybody knows that we are in the same boat. So. We, we, we need to share some data we have, and 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 one. I mean, I think people can make arrangements and agreements. Uh, for instance, I can use an example in which uh, I, I'm working on a project on paleoecology, uh, ecomorphology using uh, bovid uh, bovid material. We were supposed to go to to various museums to collect the data, but I emailed people who I I know that I already have the the, the the data. I have the fossil data for that. They have they have the um, modern uh, antelope data. And, and I said, you know what? Can we collaborate on this? Can we make this a project which can actually be a multi-site project and we can actually sort of co-author, um, maybe get one or two articles out of this. And, and people, people are actually listening now and willing to, to do that. So I think, I think this is showing us the other aspect of that we have to work together. Uh, right. and we're, we're, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. And hopefully you all can hear me. I know my, my AirPods side, I know my mic is a little muffled. I was going to say, I can speak to that as well. Um, I'm trying to think creatively about how, you know, I can situate my own project within other projects going on in Georgetown. There's the Georgetown um, Remembered with the descendants of the Georgetown University. There's Mount Zion Cemetery where they're trying to memorialize white burial grounds. I'm going to situate mine within these larger um, projects of black uh, reconciliation and memorialization. And there have been times where I have been actually cautioned, like, well, don't collaborate too much because it seems to be like your project. It seems to be your thing. And I'm like, you know, in, in, in the space of these multi-marginalized bodies under these like parallel pandemics, I don't think that could be actually the forefront of our research objectives. Thank you. Um, I think, so we're almost out of time. We have one more question I think we can fit in here. It says, can panelists suggest starting points for using publicly available databases? James? So I think one of the most, uh, well, actually, I'm going to plug uh, Asher Raji Rosinger. He had a really, really, like, fabulous um, yeah, H, uh, human bio, American Journal of Biology Toolkits article about secondary data analysis that I think would, uh, that a lot of people interested in doing, using publicly available data for at least biology research can uh, look at to, and yeah, kind of lists a number of publicly available uh, data sets. That, they can, that the people can then uh, use to do you know, that kind of secondary data analysis work, which I think is something we need to learn to appreciate a lot more in biology and biological anthropology, just because of the ubiquity of these large data sets that are kind of, there are a lot of questions that they, they could be answered with. Great. Um, Katie and Kelly, do you guys wanna uh, wrap up? Sure. So I just want to thank the panelists that, um, and Leslia and the AAPA for uh, coming together and having such a great panel today. Thank you all so much for clapping. <laughs> um, and I just want to say that uh, the next panel is going to be in two weeks, and it's about uh, thinking about different types of careers, um, alternative careers to academia, and a lot of different ways you can use a PhD in biological anthropology. So that should be a really interesting panel. And if you guys have, if anyone has any questions about this panel that we had today, you can send us, Kelly or, or I, questions. And um, yeah, so thank you all so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, this was fantastic. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye. Hi, right. thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you.